everyone, it's Carla from the Western Development Museum Moose Jaw. I work here as the Education and Public Programs Coordinator. Today I'm going to share a story with you from a book that I got when I was a little girl and it's called The Golden Days Coat. Now this was written back in the year 1979 and it talks a lot about different times. Have you ever heard about the olden days? How about the words old-fashioned or way back when? These words describe a time that happened before the time that we live in now. The trouble with these words is that we don't always know what time period that someone might be talking about. If you were born in the year 2011, the year 1979, when this book was written, might seem like the olden days to you. In museums, we like to use words like 100 years ago or in the 1920s to better describe the time when something happened or when people might have used an artifact that we have on display. In this story, the olden days that they talk about take place in the early 1900s when settlers were starting to move to the prairies. Ready to do some time traveling? Let's begin. The Olden Days Coat, written by Margaret Lawrence and illustrated by Muriel Wood. The snow outside Grand's house was fine and powdery and it shone in the late afternoon sun as though there were a million miniature Christmas lights within it. The bare branches of the maples cast blue shadows across the white expanse of the lawn. Sal thought briefly of lying down in the fresh snow and sweeping her arms to and fro to make a snow angel. But the snow looked so good as it was, with not even a footprint in it, so she decided to leave it that way. village street was quiet, no one in sight, and the old yellow or red brick houses were solid and serene, their front porches decorated with spruce bough wreaths and colored lights. Sal felt she ought to be happy, but she was not. She was depressed, miserable, and sad, and at the same time slightly ashamed of herself for feeling this way. It wasn't that Sal didn't like visiting her grandmother. Any other week of the entire year would have been just great. But tomorrow would be the first Christmas day of all the ten Christmases of Sal's life that she wouldn't be spending it in her own home. Even though Mother and Dad were here, and even though Gran was a terrific person, it wasn't the same. As long as Sal could remember, Gran and Granddad had spent Christmas in the city with Sal and her parents. But Granddad had died this year, and Sal still missed him, and could hardly believe that she wouldn't see him again. Gran hadn't been too well lately. She'd like to spend Christmas at her place, Sal, Mother had said. I think she'd like, oh, I don't know, I just have the feeling that she'd like to have at least this one Christmas in her own home right now. It had been a new thought to Sal that Gran might want Christmas in her own home, just as Sal wanted Christmas in her own home. But she and Grandad always spent Christmas at our house, Sal had almost shouted. Didn't she want to all those times? Well, sure she wanted to, Mother had replied gently. But now with Grandad having died, well, she misses him a lot, Sal. And their house in the village is the one they lived in together for so many years. If Sal missed Grandad a lot, how must Grand feel? All at once, Sal had seen how her grandmother must feel. So naturally, she had to agree and try to act pleased with the idea of the trip, even though she wouldn't be seeing Mary and her Kathy or any of the other kids on Christmas afternoon to prepare presents, and wouldn't be going to the Christmas Eve carol service with them all, and wouldn't get to see her own special decorations on the tree. The tiny golden and blue glass peacock, the silver bells, the little Santa Claus, and all the others that had been a part of Christmas it seemed forever. Sal didn't want things to change. Of course, things did change, and you had to get used to it, but sometimes it wasn't at all that easy. So here she was at Grand's place, not knowing even one kid her own age in the village, and bored. What was there to do? Answer? Nothing. Mother and Dad and Grand were all in the house, tearing around doing things, last minute present wrapping, making the stuffing for the turkey, and so on and so on. They had asked her to help, but Sal just didn't feel like it. She had said she was going outside for a while to play. Play? Play what? And with who? Then Sal remembered the shed behind Gran's house and what was kept there. The door was a bit difficult to open, but Sal finally cracked 
the hinges into action. Good, the old trunk was still there, and inside it, the photograph albums. On nearly every visit, Sal's dad would say, Mother, shouldn't all that stuff be in the house? And Gran would say, polite but firm, the shed's dry and I've got no room for another blessed thing in this house, James. And anyway, the past is in my mind. I've got no great need for photographs. Sal wondered what it would be like to have all that long past in your mind. She leafed through the albums. Some of the pictures were a pale brown, faded color, and some were shadowy black and white. None were in color, for they'd been taken before the days of color film. How peculiar they looked. Pictures of the village when it was even smaller than it was today. Pictures of people sitting in high up little carts pulled by horses. Pictures of families all dressed up and sitting on front porches. Pictures of square-shaped, teeny-looking, olden days cars. A picture of Gran as a young woman, her hair braided and fitted nicely across the top of her head, her long dress patterned with small flowers. Another of Gran, some years later, but still young-looking, with her hair cut shorter, and the dress also much shorter, standing on the steps of the brick house, which was then new. How long ago it must have been. Imagine that young woman being there, Gran. It almost seemed as though it must be a photograph of somebody else entirely. But Gran's name was printed under the picture, and there was Gran's same smile, and the same eyes looking friendly and, well, interesting. What a strange thing time was. It went on and on, and people came into it, and then they went out again, like Granddad. There was a time when she, Sal, had not even existed, and now here she was, and would grow up, and maybe have children of her own. Maybe someday she would even have a granddaughter. It was as hard for Sal to think of herself being old like Gran as it was to think of Gran having once been 10 years old. Sal picked up another album and the pages fell open at a photograph of a girl about her own age. A really old fashioned girl with a floppy bow in her long hair and wearing a frilly dress down past her knees with a huge wide sash at the waist. And look at that, striped stockings and high button boots. Why on earth did people wear such funny clothes away back then? Sal chortled to herself, then suddenly stopped. Years and years from now, would her own jeans and t-shirt, or even her dress-up long skirts, look funny to some other kid? Maybe even to her own granddaughter? What a weird thought. And could this photo right here be Gran as a kid? It didn't say, and it was impossible to tell. This girl was sort of frowning, and you, you couldn't see the eyes very clearly at all. She looked uncomfortable, as though she wasn't enjoying having her picture taken, all dressed up like that. Well, no wonder. The frilly dress had dozens and dozens of little buttons down the front. Imagine doing all of those up, and the sash looked too tight. Sal put down the album and dug deeper into the trunk. She came up with something she had never noticed before on other visits to Gran's place. A girl's coat. An olden days coat. It was dark navy blue with a hood, and at the waist there was attached a narrow red wool sash. It looked as though it might fit Sal. She decided to try it on. She slipped out of her own coat and made it into the new one. It fitted her perfectly. And then, Sal felt all at once very dizzy. There was a moment of darkness, and she wondered if she was fainting. She had never fainted, so she did not know what it might feel like. She decided that it wouldn't feel like this. For an instant, or for a long time, she wasn't really sure which, Sal didn't think anything. It was not like sleep. Rather, it was like going away from yourself for a while, like losing track of time. And yet, oddly enough, she wasn't afraid. Sal rubbed her eyes and looked around her. She was standing outside in the snow. How had that happened? She did not recall having left the shed. It must have snowed a whole lot more since she'd entered the shed. How long had she been in there anyway? The snow was now nearly up to the top of her boots. She was wearing the navy blue coat with the hood and the scarlet sash was tied around her middle. But she didn't have her gloves. She had taken them off to look at the photograph albums. She turned back to the shed to get them and then she gazed around in total bewilderment. The shed was not there. Sal swung around to face Gran's house. Now she knew for sure that something very odd was happening. The house was not there either. Where was she? 
across the road, an old church still stood. Thank goodness for that. At least she was still in the village. But wait, some of the other houses on the street were missing too. And neither the street lights nor the telephone poles were anywhere to be seen. There were no TV aerials. The maple trees were there, but they looked different. They were much smaller. Trees could grow, although not quickly, but surely they couldn't shrink. For a moment, Sal felt a sense of panic. Where am I? Where am I? Then she remembered the photograph albums. The street looked very much like some of the earliest photographs. Could it be that she was in some different time? How could that be? Yep, here she was. Wait a minute, she said to herself. Hold on here. Let's think now. She had put on the olden days coat and then the feeling of losing track of time. Those things must be connected. But if she really was in some other time, how to get back? Or as it would be forward? She had thought that this was going to be a boring Christmas, and now look what had happened. Would she ever return to her own family? And if she didn't, then what? That was a possibility too terrible to think about, at least for now. As long as she was here, or wherever here was, she might as well have a good look around. Sal began walking, and in no time she was out of the village and into the open country. The narrow path enabled her to walk without much difficulty. It had not been plowed by a snow plow, that was plain enough. But the snow was hard packed, and there were marks on it made by, what? Not cars, not trucks, not wheels of any kind, it seemed. What had made the double set of smooth tracks in the snow? The boughs of the spruce and cedar trees glistened with snow and icicles as though they were newly decorated Christmas trees. Sal put her hands into the coat pockets and trudged along, now feeling almost lighthearted and confident. She felt in her bones that something was going to happen, something interesting, and she was eager to know what that would be. When it did happen, however, Sal was so startled she nearly fell into a snow drift. The sound of horses' hooves, the sound of bells, Whoa, Brownie, whoa, Star. It was a girl's voice, loud and strong. Before Sal knew what was happening, the sleigh drew up beside her. Of course, the tracks in the snow had been made by big sleighs, not the little sleighs that Sal had always known that you pulled by yourself to the top of a slope if you could find one in the park and then got on and whizzed down. This sleigh was no toy. It had seats for two people at the front and two at the back. It was built gracefully like a big swan-shaped boat, and it was painted a bright crimson with gold swirls. Underneath it were long sleigh runners of metal and wood, curving up at the front. Pulling it were two sleek brown horses with bells on their harnesses. The driver was a girl who looked about Sal's age and size. She had warm brown eyes, mischievous and friendly, a slightly upturned nose, and a wide grin. She was dressed in a tight-fitting black coat and she had blue wool mittens on her hands and a blue wool knitted bonnet on her head. Around her knees was tucked a sort of blanket of coarse strag straggly fur. Hello there, she called to Sal. Where are you bound for? Do you want a ride? A ride in the sleigh? Sal certainly did. She climbed in and the girl motioned to her to tuck the fur robe around her legs. Then all at once, Sal felt not only shy but nervous. This strange girl was going to ask questions, and Sal was not at all sure that she could answer them. I haven't seen you in these parts before, the girl said. Who would you be then? Think quickly, Sal said to herself, and it better not be a lie either, she told herself sternly. But how to tell the truth about the situation, when she wasn't even sure what the truth was? She somehow knew deep inside her that if she was ever going to get back home again, she must not tell any lies. This was going to be tricky. Oh, we don't belong in the village, Sal said hesitantly. We're just spending Christmas here with a relative. The girl's next question almost certainly would be, who's your relative? Everybody would know everybody else here. It was a small place. And then Sal really would be in trouble. She glanced around her, searching for a way to change the subject. Her eyes caught a flash of blue and white. Look, she cried, that bird, what is it? It's a blue jay, the girl said. Cheeky little things, those jays. I tame them in the winter, and they'll take bread from my hand. 
Sometimes I throw bits of fat or bacon rinds into the snow for them, and they always find them. They often follow me, just in the hopes of some food. Really? Sal said, impressed. A girl who could tame birds and drive a team of horses? Sal had never known anybody who could do those things. But of course, there weren't many of horses around nowadays. Nowadays? Sal felt confused all over again about when she was and where. My name's Sal, she said, as though to make quite sure of at least one thing. What's yours? Sarah, the strange girl said. We live at New Grange Farm. Are you allowed, I mean, do you often take the sleigh and horses by yourself? Sarah laughed. I can take the cutter out almost any time I like. Papa knows I'm as good as my brothers with the horses. Sal felt a twinge of envy. Imagine being able to go out in this sleigh. Cutter, she must remember its name. Any time you want it. She wondered if Sarah felt lucky or if she took it for granted because it was what lots of people did here. The horses plunged onward, their harness bells jangling. The cutters sped through strands of spruce and pine, glittering and shimmering with the snow on their boughs. Sal thought it was the most exciting ride that she'd ever had in her entire life, even counting the giant Ferris wheel of the exhibition. I've been over to my best friend's house, Sarah was saying. I wanted to show her my early present. We're always allowed to open one before Christmas Day. Oh, do you do that? Sal cried. We always have an early present too. This detail made her feel quite close to Sarah and she sensed that Sarah felt the same. What was your early present, Sarah? Sal asked curiously. Sarah dug in her coat pocket, holding the horse's reins easily with one hand and brought out a small object wrapped in red tissue paper. And she handed it to Sal. Here, look, Papa carved it for me and Mama did the painting. I shall cherish it always. I'll hand it on, I really will, to my children and their children. Papa and Mama laughed when I said that, but I think they were a bit pleased too. Sal unfolded the paper carefully. Inside was a carved wooden box. On top of the box, its wings delicately shaped in wood and painted a glowing orange and black, was a monarch butterfly. Sal knew it was a monarch because her dad had pointed out that kind of butterfly to her on a visit to the village last spring. They were called monarchs, dad had said, because they were like the kings and queens of all the butterflies. On the underside of the box were these words, to Sarah from her loving parents. It's beautiful, Sal said. I've never seen anything like it. Won't you come and meet my family, Sal? Sarah asked. They'll be glad to meet you, I know, and your folks wouldn't worry for a little while, would they? I could take you back to the village later on. Sal gulped, danger! Meeting Sarah had been like getting a special and unexpected Christmas present, but going to New Grange Farm, that was something different. She could just not do it, but how would she get out of doing it? If Sal went to the farm, as soon as she undid the olden days coat, Sarah and her family would see that Sal's clothes were not at all like the kind worn here in this place. They wouldn't understand, and how could she ever explain? You couldn't go into a welcoming house and not take off your coat, that was for sure. But she could not take the coat off there. She mustn't. It was her only chance of getting back home, and if she tried it at the wrong moment and in the wrong place, Sal was all at once terrified. She might never be able to return to her own place, her own family. Sal felt tears wanting to come to her eyes. She blinked them back furiously. This was no time for feeling sorry for herself. Action was what was needed, and that action had to be her own. Sarah was totally unaware of the danger, and she must remain so. It was up to Sal to find a solution. What was she to say to Sarah? How could she, without being unkind and grateful, get out of the sleigh? She certainly could use a little help, Sal thought. Sal had just handed the carved wooden box back to Sarah and was frantically searching for an answer to Sarah's invitation when a shower of huge icicles, sharp swords of frozen water, snapped and fell from a tree bough directly in front of the horses. Crash! The horses reared in fright and bolted away down the snow path. The carved box flew out of Sarah's hands as she grabbed for the reins that had been torn from her grasp. She snatched the reins back again and pulled hard, but the box was gone.
My box, Shara shouted. She soothed the horses then, her voice coaxing them out of their fear, and finally she brought the cutter to a halt. I'm going to go and look for it, Sal offered quickly. You hold the horses, okay? Sarah agreed, and Sal ran back along the path through the forest. To find the box seemed an impossible task in all that snow. Supposing it had fallen into one of the deep drifts, no one would ever be able to find it. Sal located the place where the horse it had reared and began looking. Hopeless. Then she noticed a blue jay, hovering a few inches above the snow, darting down, searching for something. The bird settled and began to explore the snow. Sal rushed over and shooed the bird away. Sorry, bird, she whispered under her breath. Better luck to you next time, but thanks. She scooped away the soft snow that was light with her hands, and there it was. Nestled in the snow, quite unharmed, was the precious box. Sal snatched it up and ran back to Sarah. The jay found it, Sarah, the jay found it. He thought it was food and he found it. Here it is. Sarah took the box and grinned. Oh, Sal, how can I ever thank you? Now you'll surely come home with me. Sal remained standing on the path. This was her only chance and she knew it. Now she could just do it right. Sarah, I'd love to, I really would, but I can't. My family will be worried. No, I know what you're going to say. You don't have to drive me back, but thanks anyway. It's not that far and it's not that cold. I have to go but I'll always be glad I met you. No lies there, not a one. Now if only the rest of it would work out. Sarah nodded in understanding. The horses wanted to be going on again, so she drew in gently a little bit on the reins, reassuring them that they'd be off again soon and away. Maybe we'll be able to see each other. Over Christmas then, Sarah said. Maybe, Sal said doubtfully. She wished with all her heart that such a meeting could be. The two girls said a warm goodbye, and Sarah turned to flick the reins and tell the horses to go on. Now was the moment for Sal's desperate plan. The timing had to be absolutely right, or she was done for it. It would certainly been the putting on of the olden days coat that had brought her here. It must be the taking off of the coat that would take her back home again. But the coat had to be tossed into the back of the cutter for the plan to work. Would she be able to do it swiftly enough before the sleigh sped away? And would she be able to do it so that Sarah would not notice? She had to risk it. Sal had already untied the red wool sash of the coat. As the cutter started up again, she slithered speedily out of the coat. In a flash, she had it flung onto the back seat of the sleigh. It landed with a plop. The sleigh bells were ringing out and the horses were dashing along. Sarah, guiding the horses, didn't notice the thrown coat and didn't look back at Sal shivering without a coat in the snow. Sal had a split second to realize that the coat would go to New Grange Farm and that there would be some good reason, unknown to her, for its being there. It would travel through history until blackness. Sal lost track of time. Everything blurred and faded. Sal opened her eyes. She was sitting on the shed floor with her coat beside her. How come? And yet she didn't feel cold. She put on her coat and looked around her. The photograph albums of long ago were spread out on the floor. She picked them up and began putting them back on the trunk. As she did so, she noticed something. There on the bottom of the trunk, neatly folded, was an olden days coat, a girl's coat. It was a dark navy blue color with a hood and at the waist there was attached a narrow red wool sash. It looked as though it might fit Sal, and for a moment she thought of trying it on. But just then a voice boomed into the shed. Hey, so this is where you've been all this time. Did you go to sleep or what? Luckily it's fairly warm out for this time of year. We've been a little worried about you. Dad was standing in the shed doorway grinning. I. I, I don't know, Sal said. I was looking at the old albums and I guess I lost track of time. What time is it now anyway? Just time for you to open your early present, Dad said. Gran and Mother were sitting in the living room. Sal had to admit that the tree that they decorated since she was out was really splendid and even though the ornaments were not those she was used to. Then she saw the peacock and the silver bells and the small Santa. They were there on the tree. Her ornaments were there. You brought them, she cried. We thought you'd like to see them on the tree as usual, Mother said, hugging Sal. Gran was tall and thin and her 
hands were gnarled like old tree branches. She was wearing her favorite brown and blue silk dress and the gold necklace that Grandad had given her long ago. Her hair was a feathery white. She didn't look a bit old-fashioned. She just looked like herself. Her eyes had the same brown warmth they always have. What is your early present to be then, Sal? Gran asked. The one from you, Sal said instantly, not knowing why that was the one she wanted most to see. Well, it's not anything new or glamorous, Gran said a bit mischievously. She handed Sal a small package wrapped in bright paper. Sal opened it slowly, making it last a long time. When the wrapping was off at last, Sal stared. There in her hands was a carved wooden box. On the top, its wings delicately shaped in wood and painted a glowing orange and black, was a monarch butterfly. I've been saving it, Gran said. Your granddad and I didn't have a daughter, but your dad and mother gave us a very fine granddaughter. I've kept this to give to you the year you were 10. My father carved it and my mother painted it, and they gave it to me the year I was 10. Sal turned the box over in her hands. She read the words on the underside to Sarah from her loving parents. Only now did she recall whom she had been named after. The name Sal was actually short for Sarah. Sal looked at Gran and her heart thudded. Gran, it's beautiful. I'll always cherish it. Where did those words come from? Sal knew they didn't sound exactly like her, and yet she knew that she meant them. She'd heard someone say them, and now she couldn't quite remember who or when. She knew only that this Christmas was the one she would remember all her life. I know you will, Gran said. It's what I guess you could call a family heirloom now. You know, I nearly lost it the very day I was first given it. Nearly lost it in the snow. How did you find it? Sal asked curiously. Gran smiled. It was a far away smile, and yet it was close as well. It's the oddest thing, Gran said. I never could quite remember afterwards. I hope you enjoyed this story as much as we did. We found some museum artifacts like this cutter, the trunk, and the boots that are here on the table from around the same time that Sal traveled back to when she met Sarah. They look a little bit like the illustrations that we saw, don't you think? We also have our own olden days coat made out of bison hide, which is the same material as the blanket that the girls used in the cutter to keep warm. Sometimes things like this coat and the heirloom butterfly box in the story, they get passed along through families. Sometimes things like this are, are donated to museums because they are so special, they're one of a kind, or they tell a great story about the time that they were used. Do you have any family heirlooms? You can find out more about the artifacts like our cutter and coat and other things of this nature from our website at wdm.ca or follow our Facebook page. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.